Um, our next speaker then will be Bill Rexdale, and he's doing infinite loops, uh, program test, program test, program test, and so on. Bill, are you ready to present? Yeah. We are Please ready. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. We are about ready. That. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. The um, topic today is going to be fairly short. And I suggest you have paper and pale pencil happy, handy because I'm going to show two lines of code that you might want to jot down or make a screen capture of it. Um, the material will be posted, but I think it'll be quite informative if you jot down the two lines of code when they come along. I'll point it out. So this is program methodology. In fourth, we, we code and test incrementally. We code, then we do some testing couple of new words, design, test again. We go through a cycle of code, compile, test, and code, compile, test. However, we don't necessarily need to have the testing available all the time. It would be nice to have the testing only when we make major changes, and then we can reactivate our testing. So the idea is when the code is completed, the tests may be repeated, but only repeated from uh, one point forward. In other words, instead of testing everything, maybe you just want to test the last two or three components. So historically, we've had the use of the uh, high level words, if, else, then, the bracketed if, else, then. These are interpreted at the source code level, whereas of course we know the regular if, then, else is at the compile level. So I'd like to build on that. The way this operates, of course, is that the bracket if takes a Boolean flag if that flag is uh, non-zero true, we execute or compile the text following until else, then jump to then. If however, it's, it's uh, zero or false, we execute or compile the false code. So this is selective. You can selectively choose, do you want to execute the code after the if or after the uh, else? And as a note, uh, the, the bracket if is an immediate word. It actually contains a little mini interpreter that looks for else or then. And so if can be embedded in colon definitions or in source text, and it will allow again, selective interpretation or selective compilation. So how can we actively select test sequences? Here is the screen I would suggest you screen uh, copy or you write down. There's only two lines that are important. First is that we declare a value called test limit. In this case, it's set to seven but the test limit is going to uh, determine the range of testing that you execute. And then the word that I call star if, star if takes a number, a test number off the stack and it compares it to test limit. And if the result is uh, true, then it will execute paren if. So this is a selective way to execute the if based on an input number. And the input number is our test number. So if, when, it, when, you re, when you encounter an if, it's going to accept that number and it compares to the limit, equal or greater to interpretation continues to X. Otherwise it just skips to the then and no tests are completed. Here's the D chart for it. We simply have the top left a code module. After the code module, we give it a test number. And then if, if that uh, test number is uh, equal to or greater than our test limit number, then the code sequence test code and report will, will be executed. Otherwise, the test sequence is jumped and we go to then. So here's a typical ex uh, example of a test. This is test number eight. So you see at the top left eight going to star if, if our test limit is set to eight or, or less, then the following code will execute. The dot paren gives us a little reminder. It says this is test eight, and it's a test of, in this case, the word subrandom. The next two lines uh, take a uh, matrix. The A bracket is a matrix. A uh, random number is generated, and the matrix is filled with random numbers. And then the, uh, the A bracket bracket list lists that. So this is a simple way. We're testing the word subrandom. We give it a test conditions and then we list the result. Again, selectively, we may or may not uh, execute that. If it executes, the output is going to show us the eight test of subrandom. Remember, that's in the little um, 
uh, dot bracket sequence. That's a reminder of what the test is. And then the uh, listing of the matrix content with random numbers. It can be a little more complicated than that. We can have a code module with our selected uh, star if, and then inside that, we can then have additional tests that are made in the usual uh, fashion for if else then. So in this case, this allows say uh, uh, multiple uh, testing sequences, which we'll show right here. Here's a, a test sequence, test number four, and it's testing plus minus divide. We come up with a series of numbers, 100, 500 plus, 200, minus four, divide, and we expect to get the number 100. So at the end of that line, we say 100 equal. This is testing to see, did we get the expected result? If it's, we did and it's true, then the bracket if will execute, and it'll give us a little report that says got the expected 100. If, however, the math is wrong, the numbers are wrong, or our setup is wrong, we'll get a little message that says error in math operators. And then you see the four bells there. I like to include that. The bell is the ASCII seven character. And by ringing the bell four times, it's an alert. It says test number four failed. And it's a little wake up call to say, uh, better stop and see what went wrong. So in this case, it works properly. We're getting the little confirmation message of, of number four and the, uh, the, the fact it's testing plus minus and divide. And then we get the message. We got the expected 100. Uh, interpretation compilation continues. And the alternate would be if the test fails, you get the, the failure message and then the ding, 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 which is the bell rings four times. Here's one that's just a little more comprehensive. This is uh, test number seven, and it's testing the literal filling of matrices under two conditions. Uh, the first section of code takes a matrix uh, A and fills it with literal values and lists it. The A list lists the literal values. To test if this process can be compiled, that entire sequence is created as a colon definition. And then again, it's tested. Uh, the second line from the bottom says that A is filled with zeros. Uh, then um, we use the fill command to fill it with those uh, integers, and then we list it. And finally, at the end, we forget A. So that whole sequence is rather involved but this is what we see on execution. It tells, shows us the test number eight. What it's doing, it shows us the first sequence filled with uh, integers and the second sequence. So again, um, there's no interruption as long as everything goes fine, it will uh, execute right from top to bottom. Here's a live example. Uh, this is about a thousand line program on matrices and I carry all of the test programs for all of the components in this matrix language. So there's about a thousand lines of code and you see the tests are there. We'll go backwards and take a look at them briefly. Now again, I don't run all the tests all the times, but whenever a major change is made down at the bottom structure, uh, simply I can change one number on that test limit sequence and I can recover all of the tests. Here's a comparison with and without the full testing. If I do a F load of the file, which is uh, this matrix two file, if the testing is fully uh, performed, the recompilation takes 5.5 seconds. On the other hand, if I reload with no testing, then it takes 26 milliseconds. And um, very often I've got the testing set about three quarters of the way through so that it may take maybe one or two seconds extra to do all the testing. So why are we doing this? Well, the first is that you're thinking most clearly about the code just as you have written it. And very often I write the test sequence before the code. So that becomes an object objective in the structure of the code is to match the test sequence. So while you're writing the code, think about writing the test methods before or after. You're able to preserve those methods in the source code. A lot of times if I'm typing a test from the console, it's, I type it and it's gone. This way, most of my testing is done inside the source code. And then again, the test routines are only reused when they're needed. Uh, I'd like to uh, credit other people who've done testing. Uh, Ulrich has a paper at Euro 4th uh, 2019 on testing. The, uh, the uh, 
4th, 2020X has a test suite and it gives a, uh, a testing method that is very straightforward and very simple one line processes. And finally on GitHub, uh, uh, a uh, programmer named Ending has a simple test. I'd like to thank Andrew McEwen and Tom Zimmer again for creating Win32 4th. This is a gold mine of resources. Uh, and also I'd like to thank the European team who updated it in the early 1920s. This material can be found at my GitHub site, uh, Bill Ragsdale, under fourth projects, and this is program and test. And then I have written a 90 page guide to Win32 Fourth, which also on the same site. I will copy these over into the co uh, comments. So any people want to visit that code, it's available. And so back to mission control. Thanks for your help and your attention. All right. Thank you very much. Fantastic, uh, excellent. So, do we have questions to do? Not a question, but I just want to show Bill. Yeah, scientific force. Yeah, I got a copy of the uh, scientific force. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is gold mine. They sell on eBay for $125. <laughs> wow. Yeah, great. <laughs> You're very fortunate. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And the work I've done is the work I've done is derived uh, very directly from that book. And probably in a month or two, I'll uh, give another talk on um, uh, data structures, uh, th two dimensional data structures. Uh, but that, mm -hmm. that book is a gold mine. However, it is very dated. Unfortunately, um, it has uh, extensive work on memory management, which is no longer necessary. And it has a very powerful but complex way of typing math operators. So um, anyway, but it's a gold mine of knowledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs>